Our next speaker is Grayson Cook. And uh, I was first, um, I first saw Grayson Cook's work um, just trawling the internet, looking at interesting uh, spatial data. And what I was really interested in was how Grayson Cook takes spatial data um, and it's spatial data that nobody really cares about. He's, he's talking about invalid data. He takes it and makes it valid again, not in a geospatial context, but in a aesthetic context. Uh, Grayson's gonna tell us about new uses for invalid data, satellite imaging and Path 99. Take it away, Grayson. Super, thanks very much, Jonah. So I'll just go through the screen share process. Um, please sing out if at any stage I drop out or you can't hear or see. Um, so, um, talofa, bula, kia ora. Um, I'm speaking to you from Bundjalung country here in northern New South Wales, and I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also acknowledge that this country, this land that sustains me um, as, a, as a body, but also especially as an artist, um, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. And thank you very much, Jonah and Namaya, for inviting me along to speak. Um, I'm an artist, I'm a non-scientist. Um, so speaking to a room full of mapping and GIS experts is um, a, a little bit scary to me, but um, you know, I, I, I guess through the work I've done, I've just developed, developed an enormous um, awe and appreciation for the technical wizardry that goes into the, the materials that I investigate um, from an artistic and kind of conceptual um, space and approach. So hopefully there's something here that resonates with you. Um, so I started working with satellite imagery um, and Geoscience Australia in 2017. And the feature film Open Air was the first major output from this. And it was launched at the National Film and Sound Archive in 2018, while I was doing an artist residency at Geoscience Australia in Canberra. And during the residency, I worked across a range of areas because GA is a really large organization. Um, my interests are pretty broad. And in terms of geoscience, they're often underpinned by the concept of the archive and the material archive as a repository of records, as well as the geological archive, geological structures and formations as the memory of the earth. And so in my residency, I engaged with a bunch of different areas at GA, the National Mineral and Fossil Collection, we can see here, Petroleum Data Repository, as well as the Digital Earth Australia satellite imaging platform. Um, and I very quickly amassed a large number of materials from my engagements, and these materials wound their way into an exhibition at the, um, the CSIRO in Canberra. But the outcomes from my work with Digital Earth Australia were much more modest this, what you can see here is basically the outcome, a single Jupyter notebook. And it's a pretty generic um, notebook really. It contains excerpts from a bunch of standard DEA notebooks um, for extracting a, um, a, a geotiff. You know, it's, it's pretty generic. You define the date range, bands of interest, the sensor, Landsat 8, a, a lat long area. I um, do a bunch of processing and then I output a geotiff. But crucially, um, this notebook has one major departure from the norm. It uses the cloud masking algorithms that the geoscientists use, but it inverts the outcome of this filtering. So because clouds obscure a clear view of the land and geoscientists track environmental change, not atmospheric phenomena, um, they use FMASK and ACA to remove clouds and cloud shadow, um, which are deemed invalid data. And which means that these algorithms are extremely powerful. They help determine a vast amount of knowledge about the state of the planet, but inadvertently, they create this huge and constantly growing archive of Australia's cloud layer, which is a really tempting um, treasure trove for a media artist such as myself. And so using this notebook, I started to experiment and I explored the country and the cloud layer across the continent. And I often used infrared um, band mappings to get a wonderful sort of surreal color space. And I started learning about the way in which these algorithms see and was always fascinated by the ways in which it often picks up parts of the land because they would be under kind of transparent um, parts of the cloud layer. And in thinking what I could do with all of this, as I was playing really, it emerged that for various reasons to do with my love of the desert 
and of salt lakes and especially of South Australia, um, I was focusing all my attention down um, path 99, which we can see here. This is an orbit of the Landsat 8 satellite that passes directly down the center of Australia. We can kind of understand it as a transect of the continent because it stretches across like the tropical north, the arid center, and then the bottom of the country really smashed by the Southern Ocean. Um, and so every, every 16 days in a sweep that lasts about seven minutes, this path passes down from tropical Oracoon and the Gulf of Carpentaria through the great sand dune systems and salt lakes of Central Australia and South Australia and out um, across the Air Peninsula and into the Southern Ocean. And I started thinking about a project that could give us a recent history of the cloud layer down this transect of the continent, down path 99. And it would explore this enormous variance in meteorological and, and climate differences experienced by the continent. So clouds are strangely maligned in popular culture. You know, they're objects of reverie and dream and contemplation, but they're also a little bit silly. You know, someone with their head in the clouds is someone who isn't living in reality and then they need to come down to earth, right? And yet clouds are vital to all life on the planet. They reflect solar radiation and so doing they cool the planet and they mediate the Earth's energy budget. And of course, obviously they're also makers of rain. And so they're core to the hydrologic cycle. And how clouds react to a warming climate is a matter of heated debate because clouds are part of really complex systems Estimating how clouds will change under global, global warming is really difficult. And so clouds are a major factor in the wide variation in estimations of climate sensitivity. And so I started to, 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 to produce, produce this project using the GA data cube and I accessed seven years of cloud data across these nine sites um, on path 99. And I actually did this during lockdown. I had a whole lot of time on my hands, suddenly being home all the time, like many people around the world. And so I decided to do um, a whole lot of work on this project by hand. And I developed a process where I could get my lat long coordinates um, in, in, in Google Earth. I get my date ranges for Path 99 um, from the USGS Earth Explorer site where I could search by path row combination. And then I could then process each image um, using my, my notebook. And um, because I was stuck at home, like everyone else, I did about 1,400 of these things um, over the space of a month or so, and I extracted them one by one from the data cube into multi-spectral geotiffs. And to render these out as images that I could use, the Digital Earth Australia team really kindly developed another notebook that I could use that would batch export um, PNGs from these geotiffs into two different band combinations. I wanted to get a true color image, a 432 mapping using RGB. And then I wanted this surreal false color um, mapping that I've just really fallen in love with, which uses the near and shortwave infrared bands mapped to RGB. So the end result was about 270 gigabytes of seven years of cloud data down path 99. And I also discovered that I could get lots of great metadata from the USGS Earth Explorer site. And for every date in my project, I could get a lot of data, which includes a column for cloud cover, um, obviously um, collected so that you can filter it out. Um, but when you map this cloudiness data across my entire data set, you get something that looks like this. And you can see at the, not at the top, the north the tropical areas, it's quite dense much more um, you know, disparate in the, in the central areas and then down at the bottom with the Southern Ocean, we've got a lot more cloud action. But interestingly, um, what this data actually gives us is a prehistory to the catastrophic um, 2019 and 20 bushfires um, in Australia. If you take the mean cloudiness values for each year across all the sites, you'll see that the cloud cover plummets across the country in 2019, Australia's hottest and driest year on record. So the Path 99 project is underpinned by this really large set of image data um, that despite being, being invalid data in terms of its geoscientific context, does tell us a huge amount about the country and the environment. 
But at the same time, it's also this project is also simply about finding a way to experience clouds for their incredible aesthetic and formal qualities and beauty. And I'm developing this project for Full Dome Planetarium Projection. It's a collaboration with New Zealand-based sound artist Dougal McKinnon, and we're going to launch it in Wellington next year at the Carter Observatory. Um, you need, so you need to imagine the circle in front of you kind of extruded and tipped up into a dome above your head. So it's very much about immersion and bringing clouds into a video editing program where I can animate them and composite them against images of the land kind of opens up these really new dimensions to the experience, becomes a kind of projection mapping with the earth because I can composite the cloud data against the landscape underneath it and I can apply effects like a kind of tilt shift focus blur, all sorts of really interesting um, figure ground effects start to emerge. And then finally, again, during lockdown, still got more time on my hands because I've cancelled all of these art projects that would have been happening and can't be exhibited. Um, I dedicated a whole lot of time to accessing and figuring out how to process data from the Himawari satellite. Now, Himawari is an astounding piece of technology. It sits in the geostationary orbit. It sees 42% of the Earth's surface. It takes an image every 10 minutes. And it records data in 16 different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum from visible light and shortwave infrared right up to thermal or long wave radiation. And because my project is about clouds, after a bit of experimentation in QGIS and Photoshop, I discovered that I could get beautiful full color um, time lapse sequences out of just the thermal bands, the, um, the, the water vapor bands. And I also discovered it was really time consuming to do this because um, I couldn't figure out how to batch process it. And there was a lot of glitches and errors in the data, a whole lot of missing, missing, you know, materials, sensor, sensor errors. And so I hired um, an ex student of mine to do it all by hand. He had a lot of time on his hand. He was in lockdown as well. And he spent over 100 hours cleaning all of this. And I ended up with a month's worth of stunning Himawari um, time-lapse data tracking the Earth's water vapor transport. And I'll just play a brief excerpt now. So this project has been about two years in the making so far and look, it's not finished. Um, the soundtrack and full export for Planetarium is all still in the works, um, but it's been an absolutely engrossing project and process so far. And I've fallen utterly in love with the enormous complexity and beauty of clouds and the way in which um, satellite data kind of can, can bring out new and unexpected aspects of them. And my takeaway from this process really, as an artist who's neither a scientist, nor a meteorologist, nor a GIS or mapping expert, is that now more than ever, it's absolutely crucial that we all have our heads in the clouds. Thank you. Thanks, Grace, and that was great. It's really interesting to see what somebody does with the sort of data that we work with all the time. You know, I have a supervisor that wants a map and, they, and I say, all right, well, here's, here's the map. And then they say, could you make it look better? And I say, what do you mean? That's, that's the data, it looks good. And it's great to, to have uh, aesthetics come before function. Thank you, thank you. Any questions for Grayson? We got thanks coming in. Uh, I'd also like to mention we have uh, people viewing the streams from five continents now. 
which uh, if you guys know any penguins, make sure they get on the stream. But uh, we're getting all around the world. Uh, Grayson, do you have any plans to take the exhibition on tour? Is it going to be just in one location or you think you can get around? Oh, I want to get around. Yep. So once it's launched, I, I want to focus next year on, on planetariums in Australia and hopefully internationally. I've got various ties with film festivals and science festivals. So if there's a planetarium near you um, and you'd like to see this work, uh, drop me a line. I would love to love to send it around the world. Thanks, Grayson. Uh, you can also uh, chat with our panelists using the chat function if you're on the Zoom stream. Sure. So I, I can't see one question. Did I change as an artist during the process? Um, look, I, you know, I think I've just learned so much more about um, about the climate, to be honest, and especially about meteorology. I'm not a meteorologist, but I engaged with um, one of Australia's really senior climatologists through this process, Kristen Jacob at Monash University, and he, he'll feature in the soundtrack for the project. He's just um, given me an enormous insight into the complexity of clouds and their contribution to um, to the energy budget. So um, I guess I've just become a bit more of a geek during this process, but that was probably going to happen. I think that's all the questions we have. I really appreciate you being part of our community, Grayson. Thank you. A pleasure.